Thank you for staying with us. And so, my name is Fumi Unwa Jeffy, and I'm still here with Tolu Lokwe. So, we're starting out with our first partner, is Shola Adeshak, and she's the founder of Smart Stewards. Shola, how have you been? Good morning. I'm Good morning. in a great place. I'm happy to be here today as well. Thank we're you. We're so glad you could make our time to join us today. So, I want to find out from you, how can women balance their short-term financial needs and their long-term goals and aspirations? All right. So, um, I love the question. When we talk about balance, a lot of things come to mind. Uh, but I think a first place to start from is for us to understand what our priorities are. Hmm. So, you, you can't balance anything when you don't even know your options. You know, uh, let, let me bring it back home to you wanting to balance your business, your career, you know, your marriage and a whole lot of things. So you, you're looking at different options and you're thinking, what am I going to prioritize? What am I going to do? Which am I going to put, you know, on the front burner at a point in time? Do you see? Well, let's bring it back home to personal finance, which yeah. is what we're talking about today. How do you balance your long-term goals and your short-term goals? I see a lot of people wanting to just set goals. You know, it's, it's a word that we use all the time. I, I want to set my goals at the beginning of the year. I want to set my goals. And by February or second week of the year, goals are in the mode already. <laughs> I think I, I like that. First of, all, first of all, quickly talk about financial goals. And my perspective about sharing financial goals is quite different. I know there's this thing about setting smart goals, making specific, measurable, attainable, and all of those things. I love those things. But I think when it comes to finances, if this approach that I am about to share would help us, you know, achieve our goals better. I teach certain three types of goals, financial goals, short-term goals, mid-term goals, and long-term goals. Right. So short-term goals are the things that you would like to achieve within one year. Mid-term goals are things you would love to do within three to five years. And long-term goals are things you would like to do seven years and above. Now, the reason I say this is because in the course of setting goals, a lot of people want to do what is meant to be a long-term or a mid-term goal within a short-term short duration. And then they burn out. You're earning 50,000 naira per month, but you want to build a house, which is not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. You will build a house, but in terms of prioritizing it, your current reality cannot support that goal. So it'll be safe for you to say, you know what? I want to build a house, which is a good goal, which is a good dream. But I know that realistically, and yes, applying faith, I can do it within two or three or four years. I will save, I will do this and that. And there's some people, some things that they are meant to accomplish within a short-term period. You know, they keep moving it and pushing it ahead. And then they feel totally dissatisfied. So what am I saying in essence? First of all, set your goals by duration. Short-term goals in the world of personal finance might include, I need to pay my rent within one year. That is sacrosanct. We all know that for those who don't have their houses yet, they have to pay rent within a year. That's a short-term goal. Another short-term goal might be, I want to relocate. I want to maybe go for my master's or I want to buy a car. A midterm goal. I mean, I, I, and these goals will differ from one person to another. So by the time you realize what your short-term goals are, your midterm goals are, your long-term goals are, you then can prioritize. And then prioritize your resources as well. If you say, I want to relocate, I want to go for my master's within one year, you know that, okay, from every money I make, this is what I'm going to be saving towards it. So how do we prioritize? Know your options. Break your goals into short term, mid term, long term, and then start to prioritize and then start to balance. It helps for effective planning of your resources. When we talk about budgeting, when we talk about saving, when we talk about we talk about these things, but realistically, we don't sit down to say how realistic are these things I am writing down. I hope that helps for starters. for us 
us to start with. I hope everyone has their notepad ready for this session. So before we dive right into the panelist session, um, Shola Shakin will be taking us through a presentation on plan your money and plan to your future to whet our appetite and give us the right information we need just before we engage um, the other panelists. So, um, Shalade Shakin, please let's have your presentation on um, planning your money and planting your future. All right, thank you. I will go straight into that and um, just in a few minutes and we'll take the conversation away from there. I love the topic. Please confirm you can see my slides. Uh, plan your money, plan your future. I, I, I love that theme for the Global Money Week. And it simply just says that, you know what, what you do right now, what you do currently, will affect what you get, you know, in the future. You want to see or enjoy a good financial future, it starts from now. And I'm going to start by sharing three things, three reasons why as women, we must plan our finances. Now, a survey was done, you know, um, by I think the DNA of Wellness Group or something. And one of the things they realized is the fact that one of the greatest unnoticed drains on individuals' productivity is the distraction that financial stress puts on people. Now, these days when people say, my mental health, my dad health, when you drill down, when you talk with people, when you coach with people, more often than not, financial stress is one of the things causing the mental health issues. Not in all cases. Causing stress in marriage. Causing emotional stress. Do you see? And there was a survey that was done and, you know, they were asking people, you know, what are some of the things that would usually cause you stress? physical, career, social, community, and financial. And look at it, 27%, which is the highest of all of those, you know, stuff, was financial. So people have career stress, social stress, community stress, and all of those things. But financial stress ranked as the highest. So why should we plan our finances? Why should we, as women especially? So the first thing is that financial stress is real. And more than ever before, when you look at the state of the economy, not just national economy, but even the global economy. You know, I was talking with a friend at the gym earlier today, and she wanted to get some things from the UK, and she was saying, these things have gone up. I mean, like, these are basic things. Um, I, you know, I, I read an article, I think it was last month, and they said that vegetables in the UK were scarce. And even when available, they were expensive. So it's not just a Nigerian thing. Everywhere, inflation, devaluation, so many things are happening. Now, if there's any time that we need to plan our finances better, it has got to be now as women. Now, what is um, another, sorry, reason why as women we must plan our finances? You know, I looked up and um, at, at some statistics and I realized that, see, we're not playing the gender or, you know, whatever card here. But as women, there are a lot of odds stacked against us. There's a gender pay gap. Those in the career field, those who are employees, can attest to this. There's a guy on the same level with you. For whatever reason, he's earning higher, right? Yes, I mean, the reason for the International Women's Day celebration and all of these things is to bridge the gap. But these things exist realistically. So if a guy is earning about 2 million on a roll, and as a lady, you're earning about 1.5 million as a roll, if both of you are single, I mean, the, the expenses are literally the same. But the guy has more money at his disposal, either to save, to invest, or to do whatever he wants to do. So as women, we must constantly realize that, hey, there are these odds against us, and we must continue to work at, you know, navigating them. Another reason as women, we take career breaks. A woman in a career lifetime would usually go on two or three maternity breaks. Yes or yes. And some people go on five. I met a lady recently who said during her career break, she took seven maternity leaves. I'm like, mommy, well done, ma. You know, we take those breaks. Yeah, you, you might have a good job where they're paying you, you know, all of those maternity perks and all of that. But you know that when you take care of your children, take care of your baby, by the time you come back to work, in one way or the other, your productivity levels 
are sort of reduced. Maybe not all, all of the time. But apart from even maternity break, sometimes we, we, we know the things that we deal with as women. Sometimes you have to just take off some time off work because of your child, because of your family. And what it means, even as business owners, is that you're not able to generate as much money as you would have loved to do. Another thing is women live longer than men. I don't know if you read these statistics. A lot of women outlive their husbands. So when the husband is gone, the woman is the one dealing with all of those things. So we need to plan financially. Even if your husband, you know, gives you stuff, you must also plan your own stuff, your own finances, so that you're not absolutely depending on what somebody has done. Another thing is lack of financial confidence. Uh, my sisters here, Sholakwe, Damilola, they operate, or we all operate in a field where you know, we're always talking about money, we're always talking about confidence, we're always talking about investors, you're always having to face a lot of things. But women lack that confidence. You know, men will show up and, you know, they start to talk, but as women. And these are some of the things that hinder us from gaining access to the things we need. Women are not able to negotiate properly during interviews. Women are not able to sell their businesses well. These things affect our financial bottom line either on a personal on a business level. Inadequate retirement savings, women don't save as much. So these are some of the reasons we must deliberately and intentionally plan our finances. Now, of course, higher healthcare costs for women. Women, we know now. We know all of us, you know, you have to do this every year, you have to do your pap smear, you have to do this mammogram, yeah. Men don't do as much, you know, um, healthcare routines as we do. And then limited access to financial resources. I'm still just um, laying a quick foundation to make us realize that as women, we must, we must plan our finances. Now, this is the third reason. And this particular image changed my life when I encountered it. And it just simply sums up the human life cycle. It says that between zero and about 22, 23 years old, you are in your learning cycle where you go to school mommy and daddy uncles and brothers are giving you money a time comes where you start to work so you're not depending on anyone you start to work you get married you have your children and then your children before your eyes start to get married i left school at 20 and i thought i had the whole world before me i look back and i'm like where have the years gone and then you work you work you work you work you're 60 you enter into your retirement phase now, when you have this at the back of your mind, you realize that you don't have all the time in the world to plan your finances. You see, that phase two is very important. Some of us right now, we are in our either early career, some are in their peak career, some are in their, you know, almost retirement. But I, I want to believe that a lot of people on this call are either in their early career or their mid career. Always bear this in mind that, you know what? The days seem so slow, but the years fly by so quickly. Nobody is going to plan your finances for you. A time will come, you look at you, and I look at my mom, this is, I'm like, when I was younger, this woman would, was working as a secretary and she had a lot of businesses. She would close on a Friday night, get on a plane, go to London, go to Europe, buy things. By Monday evening, I kid you not, my mom was back. She did multiple businesses. By virtue of those businesses, my mom should have been a billionaire today. But nobody was teaching them financial literacy. And I look at her, she's 73, and I'm like, God, one day I'm going to be like this. This is the time. So understand that there is a window available to you within which whatever you are doing, apply sense and plan for the future because nobody is going to do it for you. And this is another um, image that you can just, you know, screen grab to show you that see, you are young, you are very energetic, you are, you, are, you are full of vitality. You will continue like this, not because of anything bad happening. But a time will come, the energy you have at 20 or 30 is not the same energy you will have at 50. By 40, some of us are in our you know, 40s already. I'm like, in the next five years, I don't think I want to be running around like this. Or shall I quit? Eh? All of these things, we must have consolidated. You see, so it is important to plan. And what is financial planning? Simply the process of creating a roadmap on a, or a blueprint to help you achieve your financial goals. 
and it involves analyzing your current situation financially, identifying your financial goals, and developing a plan to help you achieve those goals. So women, this is not a time where you would say, I oh, know my daddy or my mommy, my husband, my accountant is the one handling my finances. You must be involved. You must take responsibility. Don't abdicate your responsibility, your financial future to anybody. Now, let me run through a couple of things that will help us plan. Of course, financial literacy sits at the foundation of financial planning. If you don't have the right knowledge, the skill set, and the mindset, you can't plan anything. Let me tell you guys, when I finished, uh, so, so I, I started my career very early. And as of 18, 19 years ago, I was earning about half a million per month as a chartered accountant. But my finances were all over the place. I was chartered, but my finances was scattered. You know, I was that girl that BA was doing a sale. We go, public holiday, three days. Delta, 90,000 to Atlanta, we are there, four days. I remember my very first trip to America. They stopped me at the point of entry. Now. How many days are you here for? I said, four days. You came all the way from Nigeria to America for just four days. I said, yeah, is there any big thing? They delayed me at the airport for about eight hours because they thought I had drugs on me. Now, you know, I was very spontaneous until things happened. No plan, no future, nothing. Just, you know what? The money will continue to come. Because I lacked financial literacy. And financial literacy is a function of three things. Having the right mindset about your money. That money is a servant. I am the leader. Money is inanimate. I am animate. Money is not going to get me exasperated. Because that's what I see. When we talk about money, people are like, ah, this money thing, money. Hey, this money thing, money. I don't know where my money has gone. You've got to be in charge. The second thing is the skill set. I'll talk about this during the Q&A. And of course, the third thing is knowledge. And so thank you to Nairometric Metrics for organizing this. Ladies, beyond this, you must go back to say, let me, I mean, this is not a time where, you know, they're talking about economic news and you're saying, no, oh, please, Flippy, Z World, next, next channel. We see many things happening around the world that are not within our control, but are, that are constantly affecting our finances. COVID, Russia war, look at how those things are affecting us. Now, seven things, and I'll wrap this up. Tools for your personal financial planning. You need to make money. Money is what will help you plan. So look at your income. Read this book by uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Shalape has also written a very good book about building generational wealth. I've written a book about, you know, the basic things, 40 frugal rules for your journey to financial freedom. Learn how to make money because that's what you're going to use to plan. I mean, you can't. Spending is sacrosanct. Whether you make money or not, you must spend. So you must necessarily figure out how to constantly make money because it is from what you make that you will spend. Pillar two, talk about budgeting. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to hear the word but but it is what it is. A budget is a navigator. Sit down. Map, so, so some people don't have spending problem. It is income problem, but because you have not written it down, your expenses on a monthly basis are like 300,000 and you're making 200,000. You will burn out. But you don't know, you keep saying, I have money problems. Like in my early days, each time they were praying for those in their deliverance, I'll go out because I thought I needed deliverance. So sit down with your finances, interact with your figures. How much am I earning? How much am I spending? Is there a deficit? Is there a surplus? What can I do? Number three, you need to save. Yes, you can save your way into wealth, but it's a good place to start from. And I need you to screen grab this particular image. You earn the money. You spend part of it, you save the other half, and then you invest it. And that's how wealth is built, rinse and repeat. Number four, investing. So I tell people saving money is putting money aside. Investing is putting money to work. Saving helps you build consistency. Investing helps you build tenacity because things happen. There's no time, but these are some of the things you can invest in. We'll talk about that during q and Number four, debt and credit management. I see people borrowing money for consumables, and it breaks my heart. You want to travel, your friends are going on vacation, you don't have the money, and you have to borrow. I see people borrowing money for SOEB and so many things. In this part of the world, Nigeria, credit is not something that is so common, but there are people are using informal ways to get credit 
to sort of live their lifestyles or fund their lifestyles. You won't go anywhere. Deb debt is an obligation to the past. Saving and investing is an obligation to the future. So manage your debt and stop digging that debt hole. Uh, number six, we don't talk about this a lot, but you need to manage your risk and, and get insurance for your wealth. It is in Africa, you see that ah, premium is a waste of money. You pay insurance, what? Insurance premium. What if it doesn't happen? It is that very month that you don't renew your insurance that things happen. I remember driving on Third Mainland one day and somebody's tire on the other side deta got detached from his car, rolled and bounced on my own car, <laughs> of all people, passing through Third Mainland Bridge. And my brother was driving, shattered uh, my windscreen and forced the car to a stop. If I tell you, I mean, that was many years ago. In short, things happen. Thank God I had insurance on the car. Emergency funds is also a way of security. See, in Africa, we are more about accumulating wealth, but we don't think about protecting the wealth. If something happens, may God forbid, it can wipe everything you have built for years. So we need to take risk management and insurance more importantly. And finally, ladies, understand that you operate in three economies your personal economy, the national economy, the global economy. Your personal economy is what you do with what you make, what you spend. You have control over it, small or not entirely, but at least you can know that, okay, this is what I am spending. I don't teach people don't spend money. I teach spend reasonably. Now, the national economy is what is happening in your country. For example, in Nigeria, these days, we must become more interested in politics because we say, no, it's not my business. Anybody that comes in, no, the person who comes in affects your business, affects your, your finances because their policies would indirectly affect what is happening. So put your ears on the ground. And of course, the global economy, I tell people when the president of America sneezes, it affects us. Look at how COVID, you know, affected the entire world. Look at how Russia and uh, Ukraine war affected the entire world. So ladies and gentlemen, no, not gen there are no gentlemen here, I believe. We must understand all of these seven things that I have discussed or that I have shared with you in planning our finances. Ultimately, building wealth is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, don't, don't be like, yes, I, I, you know what? I want to start now. And you, there's this initial growth I want to save. I want, but I'm not, my investment is not yielding so much. You know, it takes time. It's a lifetime project of raising and repeating. You will make mistakes. You will lose money. You will, feel, even as a, as a finance coach, sometimes I spend some, I'm like, ah, what happened? Was that village people? But I get back on track and, and I continue to build. But see, I was an, all repentance pantries who couldn't even save 100k my account despite earning 500k per month but with knowledge with literacy with the skill set here i am today i'm able to save and invest seven digits eight digits without even touching it so everybody and anybody can take their finances into their hands and begin yeah. to achieve great things i hope that with these few points of mine i've been able to convince you that a you can plan your money and plan your future. Of course, I'm the lead coach of Smart Stewards and we provide financial literacy resources for people, Africans at home and in the diaspora especially. Thank you. And I look forward to you know, the panel sessions. Oh, wow. That was, that was I don't know, very interesting. Well, thank you so much. Shalato, what did you make of that? Um, um, it, it's a very, very enlightening session. I took down a few notes. Um, for once, um, Shola said something that she was shattered but scattered. <laughs> that took me. <laughs> that really took me off balance because you can feel, you can be financially buoyant and then you don't have a financial safety net. True. So she 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 really hits the nail on so many so many salient points. Another one is savings build consistency, and then investment builds tenacity.
So there's a whole lot to pick from what Shola has said. Yeah. Uh, I also like when she talked about the fact that oftentimes many women outlive their partners and then you are there to bear the burden of so many things that you know you just some people are just like you know and like many of us say it now oh i want to be a baby girl i want to yeah. be a soft life i'm a billionaire's wife and we don't even know understand yeah. the warnings of what is really yeah. um of happening and then yeah. your husband passes and then you're clueless about yeah. how to handle the and and a better thing. way to really understand that for me is um when she mentioned the life cycle for every woman yeah. um i mean we have so many young ladies now that feel oh when i'm when i'm 30 years i'm going to save or when i'm 40 years i'm going to save the but there is time for you to save there's time for you to spend or time for you to relax and enjoy so it's also important to understand what cycle you fall into and save accordingly so that you don't get caught off balance yes uh, and i like that shala speaks from experience especially when she's telling us about how she went to america for four days Lola, you're, um, shala you're already leaving large just she was born in. <laughs> <laughs> <I know, right? laughs> she was born in. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to find out from you, even though you've shared some with us, what are the financial mistakes that many women make now, especially across board, young women, middle-aged women, older women, what are the, you've shared some from your own personal experience, mm -hmm. but I'd like for you to just share with us some mistakes that women make um, in their financial right, Thank you. I think one of the first things is that we don't take responsibility. Hmm. That's, I, I would share that from my experience and what I see. When I coach people one-on-one, -on -one, some of the things I hear is, um, you know what, my husband has been the one handling all this. I don't know, you know, and then we blame everybody. We blame our parents. Some people's parents are dead. You are still blaming them that they didn't give birth to you in America or Canada or UK so that you could have held, you know, the, the citizenship. We blame the government. Some people blame their children. I have seen women who would say, if not for you, I would have gone for my master's and my finances would have been better. Some of us, we are still blaming a bacha 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Do you see? I mean, I was just kidding. But ladies, take responsibility. Number one, financial mistakes that people make. We blame everybody but ourselves. We don't see that we are actually the ones behind the driver's seat of our financial future like they say the day you wake up is when your eyes open the start. i mean let me tell you ladies i was earning half a million and i was going to get married and i resigned and my husband to me was like why are you resigned i resigned without having savings because i felt that with my acca fellow like all of those qualifications and then i resigned i became like a jonah to my husband because at that time also they took some financial decisions in their business. And so from earning half a million per month, there was a day I didn't even have 1,000 naira. And then one month after marriage, I got pregnant. Hey. And you know, people like us, all weeks after pregnancy, everybody knows. You can't even hide it. So no job was coming. Nobody was employing me. I saw Shege. And then six months after, I got a consulting job. And I told myself, never. I will never make these mistakes again. So number one, take responsibility. Number two, embrace knowledge. I, I, I am happy that these days, women are more interested. Gone are the days where the only things we are talking about is bone air, uh, straight, straight to Kilamanko, you know, uh, bone straight, muzzle pull. You go into a place where you have women, and we're talking about investors, we're talking about venture capital. Look at them, Lola. When we got on this call this morning, the first thing we said, congratulations, Miss Ah. Those are the things we are talking about, knowledge. We have signed out of the school of Ah. Financial news and economic news is only for men. So women, well, in the past, would not just embrace knowledge, but that is going <laughs> out of fashion. And then I think the third thing, third mistake that people make is, we think we have time. And there, there are things I already mentioned. Oh, I know there's time. I, once I'm 25, I uh, know once I'm 30, I will start to take my finances more seriously. It starts now. For my experience, I'm 43 this year. I'm like, wow, well, 23 years after I left school, what happened? It was just as if I slept and I woke up. So these are mistakes that, you know what, when we put our heart to rate, we, we can correct. And I think the fourth thing is collaboration. Women are so competitive in nature, but these days things are changing and I, I'm happy. And I teach the concept of co-petition rather competition. Competition means that 
you are cooperating, and then you are competing at the same time. So we must learn to work with one another. Say, hey, Shola, please, my consultant, please come and help me. And Damnola is calling somebody in the same field to say, help me. So as women, we must leave that you know, mindset of, ah, we are, we are competitors, so they must not know what I'm doing. If you want to do, they must not know what you're doing. You will make a lot of mistakes and you will not be able to achieve your goals. So collaboration is gold. Knowledge is gold. You know, they, they will help us correct some of those mistakes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Shola. Um, and, and I think I learned a new word today, <laughs> competition, because um, you, ha you often see women go uh, at loggerheads trying to compete with each other when no one is actually chasing us. All right. So um, let, let's try and build some, some kind of um, financial foundation. Um, let's talk about building financial foundation. So I'll allow Shola to rest for a bit and I'll come to Shalakwe. Right. Um, hi, Shalakwe. So, Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good to have you once again. So talking about financial foundation, because it's easy to um, teach how to save, but then when the foundation is not right, you know, um, a lot of things can go wrong. So for you, Sherlock, but what does it mean to build a financial foundation? Where do we start from? All right. Thank you so much, Tolu. And thanks to you, Naira Metrics and Plus TV for, for putting this together. Like I always say, we cannot overemphasize on... Um, achieving financial wellness and financial independence for women, um, for our society. Because like I say, no matter how much you pump, no matter how you um, adjust monetary policies and all of that, there's no way you can lift over 200 million out of poverty without the right financial literacy. The money will be there and it will just be, you know, carouseling and going into all the waste and uh, excesses that Shola had discussed. Having said that, um, the way I perceive, you know, financial foundations, um, um, it's, it's funny. I was just thinking about it this morning. Um, typically, when you go to school, you study, then you graduate and get your certificate. Now, using that analogy, what typically happens is that um, while a lot, a lot of us are schooled, we are well, you know, um, numbered, um, we get, when it comes to money, when it comes to finance, we get handed the certificates in the finance economy without having the knowledge, right? Which is a, you know, um, and that's why we have the challenges that we typically have. So money here is the certificate and then you do not have the knowledge, you know, to make the most of that money, to grow it, to pass it on, um, you know, to make it impactful essentially. So having established that, even at 60, even at 70, you shouldn't be surprised that some people still need to go and get certified for that, you know, certificate they've been handling since age 18 or so. Um, so I'll say first, the, um, um, the first step to financial foundation, Ashola, when Shola was speaking, I just said, you know what, well, let's just share the grace and go home. <laughs> Our jobs are done here, right? You know, so without belaboring what she said, it's about making that money. It's about um, earning and it's about expanding, you know, um, your, your earning sources, your income sources. I always say that 100% um, of zero, what does it give you? Certainly zero. Okay, so if you do not expand your means, it's just going to be nickel and dime and nickel and dime. And so you can have these great dreams, you can have these huge dreams, however... If you do not expand um, your sources of income, you can't move um, um, significantly from where you are. And secondly, of course, budgeting. Um, budgeting in a way that you do not, um, you know, live um, um, out of your means. We've spoken about means. And so because Shala had also spoken about budgeting, I'd like to speak about something in that usually gets people off the... Um, uh, um, of the, the the train went between earning and budgeting and it's lifestyle creep and it happens to the most of us especially women right because they like you know <laughs> and then go take so it's lifestyle creep you are earning and living comfortably on a salary of let's say hypothetically a thousand naira and then you landed this promotion or you know maybe your business got this great gig and all of that and your um, income, let's say monthly income went up to 3,000 naira, basically, and the next thing 
you want to buy a brand new car, you want to move out of your neighborhood, you want to upgrade your bags, you want to... And before you know it, you've tipped yourself from um, an excess into debt again. So lifestyle creep is one thing that we need to um, be essentially, you know, mindful of. You know, having said that, you know, once you expand your means, you budget, and then you save to invest, as Shola had said, you save to invest, you keep money aside, and then you keep investing what you've kept aside. You know, um, that being said, you are, you know, um, you are rightly established for a great financial future. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Shalakwe. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, you have to live within your budget and within your expenses, right? But there's something they say about sharing life, life experience with people. Um, it rings better. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask Shalakwe, um, for you, what life lessons have you learned in terms of um, building financial habits? And then how has that helped you to save or spend wisely? Can you share with us briefly? Okay, yes, firstly, um, speaking about lifestyle free, right? I recall where while I was working, even before I started, you know, um, Harvest, there was a particular day, the neighborhood that was living, there was a particular day, a you know, junior officer of mine, um, I think I didn't drive that day, you know, um, you know, offered to drop me at home. And she couldn't resist it, she was just sighing, owing and eyeing. And I recall she went back to, because she felt like, why would she be living in this neighborhood? Meanwhile, I was critically saving to start my business harvest then, mm. right? So, of course, I had goals. I knew that I was saving to invest to get my business off the ground. Very well, what we were earning, what my household was earning then could, you know, you can afford to live in the choicest, you know, part of town, all of that. But again, you know, we had goals and we're saving towards that. So, you know, at times you just you see people, especially women, I keep emphasizing, I see it's not as if men do not do this, right? But here we are talking within the scope of women and how they yeah. have finances. You're just living for the mob, right? Um, and before you realize it, you know, you, you, in short, the, the best way to test the fragility of life, like Shola said, it resonated greatly with me. Um, um, one of my parents is currently ailing, the other one, and I look at them, and you, all you can recall is how they were thriving, how they were healthy, and they could do things. And now you're essentially just, you know, baby and rocking them, right? And even that. So when you look at that, when you look at life through that lens, you realize that, hey, yes, you know, um, even if you live up to 80, up to 90, your limbs won't be that strong. And these are things that I captured in my book. Mm -hmm. You know, so essentially, you've just got to essentially plan. And they're talking about um, life experiences. Expanding an income was something that wasn't taught to me. I saw my mother leave that, and I jumped on it. I tell people I started my entrepreneurship journey or entrepreneurial journey at age eight. Mm. I was I got into secondary school eight and got and came nine years, you know, in in um, um, GSS one, and I was a day student. I was raised in Ijebu, the Ogun State, by the way. So and you know that they say that Ijebu people are entrepreneurial, but because then my mother who was a, school, a, a high school teacher, but I knew then that when she closes from school, she, there was this bag, in short, at the point in time, we were not seeing that arm for the longest time. She would take that bag, she was selling clothes across all the ministries, and she'd go from Nepal to that, and then when she comes home, we we'll do, she, she, she was an old economics teacher, so we we'll bake so that she can, you know, distribute the other day. So I saw all of that, and guess what? No one told me. When I got into school, I started saving my pocket money, and then, you know, started buying biscuits and selling this. We landed in some trouble from there. But, you know, essentially, and that's why we say that women have to be, um, and parents generally yes. have to be a living example, yeah. you know, for their children. I'm glad these days, my own children, too, you know, they are being carried along in. Um, 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 how we're building businesses, yeah. saving, and they know that, yes, um, that's essentially the right way to pass a non generational wealth. Thank you very much, Shalakbe. As a matter of fact, I like the fact that um, you closed out on talking about entrepreneurship and how it's important to imbibe this culture early in our children. It's never too early, trust me. It's never too early to teach them about money, to let them know about money and what money means. Because already, um, a two-year-old can tell when you give them money. They know the bigger one, they know the smaller one. So why not just expose them to it for them to learn about it? Thank you very much, Shalakme. So I'll be coming to you, Damilola, um, talking about entrepreneurship. You run a startup company, 
And I know very well that it must have been really capital intensive um, to start this and run this organization firmly. So for, for female entrepreneurs, maybe startup founders as well that are just starting, uh, what experience can you share with them, especially when you're planning to start a company and you need capital to start it or to run it, whether you're still working a nine to five and you have your idea or you're running it already um, currently? Um, please share with us your experience, Damilola, on um, working as a female entrepreneur and how you can raise capital. Okay. Um, so my financial journey as an entrepreneur, first I would say that, you know, I always, um, this Pastor Sam's principle always has you know, caused up to me since 2009 when he says, um, you know, start small but dream big, right? Yes. Um, so at the initial stage, the dream was huge, you know, when big, build something as big as Airbnb, as big as Uber, but we did not think that it was going to be capital intensive at the beginning mm. because the, the idea was to start as lean as possible because i mean i don't have any rich dad or i didn't have any rich dad or parents or relatives so i wasn't there wasn't any plan to even get funding at the beginning it was how can i start this business as lean as possible such that you know we can you know scale from there um so we i mean you know i, I always say that i started this way you know, my house rent money. Um, I had, you know, given um, so my mom had given me, um, I think, 200k then for a house in Suyole. Then the, the landlord duped me. I got the money back. I got 150k back by police issue. And then that 150k, instead of me going to go and rent another place, I took that as a seed for, to build our first website. And went to squat with a church member, right? And it was just similar to what you know Sholakwe said. At that point in my life, this is me as a graduate of chemical engineering. My my colleagues already were working in oil and gas company. They were, you know, working in either working in, in consulting. They were anywhere. They were they were. I felt I was not. I felt I was not even on social media. I remember my friend that I told me, "How do you, how are you coping? You know, seeing your friends and your colleagues, you know." moving ahead and you are here suffering you know walking from one place to another just you know i was very mean very you know um committed very and, and the vision was very clear right because you know i knew that you know, i wanted this to be um as big as um you know uh, a, a global company right so but i was ready to do the work so we were very lean currently from you know starting very small to we're building this the, the, the MVP product, um, and you know we ran the business. You know, bootstrapped. And I said yesterday in the panel that I said that when I tried to raise funds and I was seeing that I didn't get investors that were going to be that were believing what I was I was capable of doing, I decided to turn my customers into um, my my investors. I found a way for customers to pay us before we even deliver the products, so that we can deliver the products and pay our suppliers. You know, mm. when you are under, you know, immense conditions, you will be very creative. <laughs> <laughs> true. When you don't have money in your pocket. Very true. So, very so true. that kind of culture, right, I've already, I've already formed the, the culture, of that discipline culture mm. of learning how to turn little to, you know, plenty. So yeah. when we got funding, and it was easy for us to also continue with that same discipline culture. So really, I would say that's my my own um, journey. We didn't start off as you know, looking for huge capital to start you know the business before it was viable, before it was you know up and running. We started very lean. We said you know our first account, even that website that we even built, we didn't even use the website. We used WhatsApp to communicate with customers. Mm. I used Excel sheets to to gather my data. I used email to email the customers. Our first um, technology was free. Mm. So even the um, te the social media page, I did all of those things was on Canva. So we were very, very, you know, creative and, you know, looking for ways to, to use free tools online that can help us start um, the business as, you mm. know, as much cash as possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. that's, that's, that's really, really deep. Um, thank you for sharing, Damilola. If there's anything I learned from everything she said, um, I think what stood out for me basically is your drive. 
yeah. and the passion to stand true, right, for me. Yeah. It's, it's the drive that she has because she said something about she used that rent 200k. Yeah, I remember, remember the amount. K, you know, after she, they duped her, and yeah. she had to go back to the police yeah. station to try. Hey guys, you're yeah, welcome to another episode of. So yeah, um, so it, it's that drive that, that drove her and the fact that you always have to stay true to your dream, right? But before we proceed into the panelist session, we'll be taking a quick commercial break. Remember, we are running on TV as well as on Zoom. So we'll be taking a quick commercial break and we'll be back shortly.